Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I've changed the title of the talk a little bit. I generally do do that before I give a talk as I'm working through the talk. So the title is now called Learning in the Connected Century. Now, I don't often talk very heavily about IT in my talks. I have a very strong, long-term IT background, but I don't normally when I'm talking to educators. This talk, as you'll see, is going to be quite different. It's going to keep on circling back to IT, which I think is also quite relevant because this week we saw the federal government knock the IT training parts of the curriculum out in favor of a greater emphasis on English language skills. Now, there's nothing wrong with English language skills, but as you'll see, these skills are also important. So let's get started. Part one, another click in the wall. Now, for the past few years, I've been very lucky because I've been invited to be a judge at the Young ICT Explorers event, which is held around the states. This one, of course, is held in New South Wales. And this year, it was about 200 students from 28 different schools. They came to the University of New South Wales on a soggy Saturday morning to show the judges, and I was one of those judges, what they could do in ICT. Now, this squadron of judges, there's about, I think, 30 of us, we fan out among all of the students, and the students show us their projects. So they're separated from any of the teachers or any of the parents who could coach them, and every team gets around 15 minutes with a small group of judges. So students pitch their projects, judges ask any questions that come to mind. And the students have often spent months doing these projects. So what they're getting is very valuable feedback from people who have jobs in ICT. So they're getting feedback from industry professionals. The judges, interestingly, get some infectious ingenuity and some of the buzz of inventiveness that comes when someone is brand new to a field. I, every year, come away buzzing with ideas. This year, as you'll soon see, it was absolutely no different. Now, most of these projects are quite accomplished. A few of them actually stand out far beyond the others. And the last of the projects that I judged that morning was fronted by a single student. And the single student had a large white box set up on his demonstration desk. In that white box, a wall clock had been mounted, and underneath the clock, inset into the box, there was colorful text scrolling by in a bright LED panel. Now, this student explained that his playground at the Waranga Public School had scheduled separate play periods for the various years. And he showed how his clock on a box informed students who was permitted to play in the playground at that time, because it would be illuminated via those bright LEDs underneath the clock. He had studied a real problem at his school, and he engineered a solution. And I do mean that he engineered, because that LED display, that wasn't some off-the-shelf bit of kit that you could just walk in and buy at the shops. It was wired directly to a sophisticated computer known as a Raspberry Pi, which is a credit card-sized gadget that basically has the guts of a smartphone inside of it. And that student had learned how to manipulate the signals coming out of the Raspberry Pi in order to drive the LED display. He'd also learned how to program the display. He'd learned how to write a sophisticated control program for the Raspberry Pi so that the right messages would display at the right times of day. And I, I saw all of this. He showed it all to me. I was gobsmacked. I have seen uni students in computer science display less depth in ICT skills than I saw in this year six student. Now, I was immediately quite suspicious that a parent or a teacher had fabricated the device. And so we asked a series of technical questions about its construction, about its operation. And this 11-year-old answered them all flawlessly. He detailed each of his steps in the creative process. He wasn't faking it. He really knew his stuff. So where did you learn all of this, I asked finally. Oh, he replied. I watched some videos on Adafruit. 
Now, established in 2008 as a website to educate adults in the wonders of modern electronics, which is also known as the maker movement, Adafruit provides extensive written and video tutorials on a broad selection of topics on electrical engineering and computer software. Now, I've used it myself a bit over the years. I found it very useful when I'm mastering a new skill. But I had never considered what might happen when someone with a boundless capacity for learning, which pretty much describes your average 11 year old, what happens when they would mind meld with the wealth of material available on Adafruit? And so in just a few months, this student went from knowing next to nothing to having a fairly comprehensive foundation in electrical engineering and computer science just by leaning into his desire to learn. And you're probably not surprised to hear, she won the big prize that morning. He'd earned it. And I came away wondering whether this isn't the way we should be teaching every child, helping them to find something that completely obsesses them and then turning them loose. We couldn't do that even a decade ago because none of us had access to the overwhelming wealth of resources and knowledge and experience that are now parts of our daily lives. Remember that because we're going to come back to that point. Now the second and third prizes in the year five to six category also went to rather complex hardware projects. Second prize went to some kids who had built a recycling bin that was equipped with an ultrasonic range sensor and Wi-Fi so it could measure how full it was and it could post that measurement to Google Docs which then rendered it into a real-time illustration of bin fullness. And the third prize, the third prize went to a girl who built an automatic closing cage door for her guinea pig because it had once nearly been killed by a qual who got into the cage after dark one evening because the cage door had been left open. Now all three of these inventions are practical and sophisticated. All of them reflect the growing maker movement, which asks people to DIY their own gadgets rather than simply accepting the latest and newest and shiniest from Apple or Samsung or whomever. Doing it yourself means that you have to grasp the nettle. You have to educate yourself before you can do it yourself. In each of these three cases, the kids creating these projects benefited from an explicit educational focus that was found at the core of the materials that each of them were working with, which each of them built upon. In 2005, a small group of Italian makers launched something known as Arduino. It's a very easy to program single chip computer. Arduino comes with its own programming language and environment. The environment is based on processing, which is a language that was created in 2001 to help graduate students who had no background in IT write simple but engaging interactive software. Arduino adapted that capability and put it inside of a chip. Now it took five, six years for Arduino to take off, but it eventually became an entry point for hundreds of thousands of individuals, lots of them kids, to experiment with the design of computer circuitry. There are courses taught in Arduino at university level and also at more than a few primary and secondary schools. And beyond that, there's a vast community of Arduino users who are ready to answer a question or help with a solution or simply demonstrate their own cool project. And all of that information can be found with a Google search. Case in point, as I wrote that last paragraph, I had a mind wave. I wondered if anyone had modified the Scratch programming language, which is a very simple but very powerful drag and drop programming language created at MIT. I was wondering if anyone had modified it so it could be used for programming an Arduino. And so when I typed Scratch plus Arduino into my browser, up came S for A, Scratch for Arduino. So many people 
have done so much with Arduino and documented it so thoroughly online, answers are rarely more than a click away. And that made it possible for the kids who did the bin that could measure itself and the girl that could do the automatic open and closing of her hutch door. Arduino had enough community behind it and enough answers behind it that they could do those projects. Now, after Arduino has achieved some degree of success, another group of engineers, this time these folks were out of the UK, they decided that kids needed an even more sophisticated computer, something a lot closer to what you'd see in a late model smartphone, complete with a lot of memory and networking and a really sophisticated operating system. And their goal was not to teach kids how to use computers, but to create a computer that could teach kids how computers worked. And thus was born the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi costs $35. It's credit card sized. It's almost impossible to wreck. It runs the Linux operating system and it can do just about anything that any other computer can do. You attach it to the telly with an HDMI cable, you add a keyboard and a Wi-Fi adapter, and you have everything that you need for a kid to explore almost every aspect of computing. And again, like the Arduino, the Raspberry Pi has a community in the high hundreds of thousands, sharing what they know with one another. Almost any problem anyone encounters has been encountered and solved by someone else. So the solution to most problems lie no more than a Google search away. And both Arduino and Raspberry Pi illustrate a learning phenomenon that has recently become much more common. Part two, constructivism and mimesis. Now, let's trace this phenomenon to its origins. And in order to do that, we need to go back to the early years of the 20th century. So back when William James and Sigmund Freud were making some inroads to understanding human psychology, and really that meant adult psychology, the mind of the child remained largely unknown largely unremarkable. A hundred years ago, people believed children thought like uneducated adults. Now, through a bit of research that was, as Einstein called it, so simple only a genius could have thought of it, one scientist completely upended all of these unquestioned assumptions about the mind of the child. He did this by doing nothing more than carefully studying his own children as they grow up. And it's, it's amazing, it's, it's a bit embarrassing to contemplate that before this, no one had considered the mind of the child warranted serious study. But this amazing Swiss, Jean Piaget, quickly learned that children were not merely uneducated adults. The mind of the child, he found, is something else entirely. It is a reality-testing and theorem-proving machine. From the moment that we come into the world, our interactions within it give rise to certain beliefs about how the world works. And the child is continuously putting those beliefs to the test. Where they succeed, they become incorporated into a philosophical framework of how the world works. And where they fail, the child starts again from first principles. Within those failures, every child learns the limits of the world. They learn the limits of their understanding. And that process, which Piaget called constructivism, doesn't need to be taught. It's part of a child's innate cognitive toolkit. Constructivism forms the primary learning technique for the child. And far from unsophisticated or unlearned, children are great practitioners of the scientific method. They develop theories and conduct experiments to put those theories to the test. 
Now, constructivism has another more familiar English phrasing. We call it learning by doing. And once we thought that this applied to specific learning tasks. Piaget showed how learning by doing frames every moment of the child's experience of the world. Everything gets incorporated into an individual's system of understanding. Nothing is irrelevant. Now, Piaget had a long and amazing career that spanned most of the 20th century. By the post-war period, when he was teaching in Switzerland, he'd attracted an entire school of pupils. And each of these pupils were applying Piaget's fundamental insight to their own work. One of those pupils was an engaging South African by the name of Seymour Papert. And he had, by the 1960s, been through Piaget's school and ended up at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now, at that time, around about 1960, MIT led the world in the brand new field of computing. Multics was there. Multics is the forerunner of all modern computer operating systems. It was developed on campus in the early 1960s, as was the first computer game, something known as Space War, as were the first interactive computer terminals. And although when we see it today, it looks a lot more like a schlocky science fiction film than what we think of as high technology, 50 years ago, this was the cutting edge. MIT stood at the cusp of a future where computers could listen and respond to humans. Now to listen and respond, those computers were going to need some native intelligence of their own. And so one of the great projects at MIT in those early days was work on artificial intelligence. It was broadly believed by scientists such as John McCarthy, who's one of the fathers of artificial intelligence, that we would have thinking computers in fairly short order. And again, here's another really funny point. It's another embarrassing one, because the nature of human intelligence by around 1960 was pretty much as unexamined as the mind of the child had been 50 years before, before Piaget. And beyond teaching a computer how to play chess, artificial intelligence didn't really get very far because we didn't understand how we think. Now, Papert was one of the boffins at MIT who was working on these hard problems of artificial intelligence. But because he had studied under Jean Piaget for five years, he also had an abiding interest in human intelligence. And so he started to reframe some of the questions raised by artificial intelligence as more general questions about intelligence. Could constructivist methods be applied to the computer so that humans could educate it and educate themselves through a process of exploration? And from that line of inquiry, Papert developed what's known today as the Logo programming language. Logo has the distinction of being the first language explicitly designed to be used by children. It embeds within it the constructivist processes of experimentation and theorizing and learning by doing. Logo consists of a few very simple words, which can be explored interactively, and interactivity was a very new thing back then. Those words can be put together into compound statements, and those compound statements can be put together into more complex compound statements, and so on. And because every child would probably develop their own set of compound statements, drawn from their own experience of learning, by doing with Logo, every child's experience of Logo is unique. Logo co-evolves with the child's growing understanding. Now, to reinforce the sense of experiment and play that's essential to the constructivist mindset, Piaget 
also created a logo turtle. Now, the very first turtle, as you see there, was an actual robot with an actual pen that could draw things on a piece of paper. But fairly soon, it became a screen, and you could draw things on the screen. And the interactive computer graphics that Logo had were among the first that anyone saw anywhere. They were almost unknown before Logo. But that capacity became its most important feature because children could see how their Logo programs changed what was drawn to the display and how changes in those programs changed what got drawn. And that close coupling between theorizing and seeing the experimental evidence of those theories being put into practice, that combination dramatically accelerated the speed at which children could learn Logo. Now, 20 years after he got to MIT, Papert himself got a graduate student by the name of Mitchell Resnick. He wanted to create tools for lifelong learning. Now, Logo had already had a long and successful history in educational computing. Resnick wanted more. He wanted to break the barriers down between the virtual world of the computer and the tangible world of things. And after a decade of research, and in partnership with Lego, he created something known as Lego's Mindstorms. This, this was the combination of a relatively powerful computer that could drive a range of motors and read inputs from a number of sensors, and it was married to a kid-friendly graphical programming language in which programming became a series of drag-and-drop actions with a mouse. And the two of these things together, combined with the fact that Legos already embody this constructivist idea of learning by doing, created a constructivist platform for building robots. Kids could play with the kit, connect things together, experiment, program, and learn by doing. Now that was released in 1998 in its first version. Mindstorms became an overnight success for Lego, and that was at nearly $500 a kit. It showed that children, and a fair few adults, hungered for an opportunity to play and to experiment and to theorize and through all of that, to learn. But this learning suddenly took on an entirely new aspect, not just the constructivist aspect, because at the moment Mindstorms hit the market, that was when the web really began to take off. And so Lego, very wisely, created a website where they invited Mindstormers to upload their own designs so they could learn from one another. Mindstormers populated bulletin boards and websites and educational conferences and science fairs. A technology connected became a community. And although Piaget's discovery of constructivism defines a landmark in our study of how we learn, it is not the only technique available to us. Of equal importance is mimesis. That's our ability to ape the actions of others. Children watch their parents, their older siblings, and their peers in more or less that order. And from those observations, they learn how to perform specific tasks. And here in 2014, what happens? Well, now we get to watch everyone everywhere. We have peers across the planet. With 2 billion people regularly using the internet, there are plenty of people to imitate, plenty to learn from. Much of what Mindstorms had going forward in 1998 was timing. It was the first real opportunity to leverage the creative activities of everyone else playing with Mindstorms. It was always a shared experience, and as people learned, they shared what they learned. As they did things, other people were copying what they did. So that combination of constructivism and mimesis of billions, which I call hypermimesis, that defines the learning environment for the 21st century child. So in 2006, Mitch Resnick took that programming environment he created for Lego Mindstorms and he, he stripped away the blocks 
of motors and sensors and all the things that were specific to robots and released it as the Scratch programming language. And it was moderately successful. A few kids did learn how to code with drag and drop box, blocks of Scratch and used them to animate a sprite on the screen. But it wasn't actually until the second half of last year and a brand new crop of postgraduate students working with Resnick in his lifelong kin kindergarten group at the MIT Media Lab that Scratch actually hit its stride because one of Resnick's grad students rewrote Scratch from the ground up. This time, he put all of Scratch within a web browser. And now there was no software to install. All you have to do is go to scratch.mit.edu and click on Create and Start Playing. So putting Scratch on the web has had two very profound effects. First, it makes it easy for anyone who writes any Scratch program to share that program through the Scratch website because the Scratch website's where that program lives. And as a result, today there are now six million Scratch programs on scratch.mit.edu and every one of those programs can be inspected by anyone who wants to learn Scratch by imitating the technique of someone else who has learned Scratch. Putting Scratch on the web provides a foundation for all of that learning by observing, that hypermimesis. And secondly, Scratch programs can now be embedded very quickly in any web page anywhere on the web. And that means that a child can share their work easily and immediately with anyone or if they want with everyone. You can go looking for a Scratch program, but it's just as easy now for a Scratch program to find you. Now, at the 2013 Young ICT Explorers event, I saw three or four Scratch programs out of all of the examples there. Schools were just starting to teach it. And that was before the release of the web-based Scratch 2.0. And this year, probably half of all the Young ICT Explorers projects I examined incorporated a Scratch program. It had become so easy to, go, to drop a Scratch program into a project. It had been so e become so easy for these students to learn from the efforts of millions of other students, and it had become so easy for them to experiment on their own in a web browser that Scratch has literally exploded. So we now have a new generation of children learning how to program in a style and methodology that Jean Piaget would find familiar. And it's time to take that methodology and apply it to other areas of education. Part three, Mathematica Me. Now, 10 years ago, we heard a lot about a digital divide between the informational haves and the informational have-nots, and it seemed real enough. After all, how would the underprivileged afford the devices and the programs and the data that would bring them to parity with the wealthy? How could we remediate what would obviously become a growing gap in skills and resources? And if you look at that digital divide from 2014, the view seems a bit naive because we had to reckon on Moore's Law, which mandates that every 18 to 24 months we get twice as much computer for the same price or the same computer for half price. And that's been grinding on relentlessly for 50 years. Moore's Law is the reason that my new iPhone 6 on its own has as much computing power as IBM's entire production run of mainframes from 1965. Now, in June of last year, I wandered into my local Target because I wanted to purchase a $79 tablet computer. It wasn't great. It barely had enough memory, barely enough speed, barely enough display to do the job, but it could surf the web, it could run apps, it could do the sorts of things we want from a tablet, although, often with a few seconds of delay, I dubbed that tablet craptastic. It was an acknowledgement that in a pinch it could perform 
most of the tasks that you might ask of an iPad costing 10 times as much. Now, in July of this year, I went to my local Kohl's and purchased a $69 tablet computer. And this one had four times the speed, twice the memory, and double the resolution of last year's craptastic tablet. This new tablet is not great, but it's certainly much better, and it provided the second data point that I needed to prove a suspicion. It's the cheapest bits of kit that see the greatest relative improvement from Moore's Law. The bottom end arcs upward faster than the top end. Now, it's not as though the top end and the bottom end will ever meet, but it is that within the next year, the bottom end will be more than good enough. We're seeing an influx of $70 tablets. They're being sold in grocery stores or, as in the circular that I received last week by Australia Post, they do the job. And in so doing, they cross the digital divide. Now, as devices start to become a settled reality, bandwidth looms as the next possible zone for a digital divide. Continuous access to information is necessary for mimesis. It's necessary for us to be able to learn from the lessons of others. Now, over the 11 years I've lived in Australia, I have seen fixed-line broadband costs come down dramatically. Not quite in line with Moore's Law, but enough so that the vast majority of Australian homes can afford bandwidth for learning by observing. Cheap broadband and cheap tablets represent the frame through which we need to view the digital divide. Anyone who falls outside that frame should be offered assistance, both financially and technically, to lift them into the connected culture of 21st century learning. If we don't do that, we risk a much greater expense in the longer term, because poorly educated individuals will increasingly find themselves marginalized by an economy that's at one side growing more automated, and on the other side is producing more of its wealth from the educational capacities of its workforce. Now, along those lines, five years ago, the city of Sydney made an interesting decision. They decided they were going to offer free Wi-Fi in all of their branches. And overnight, they pretty much found their branches overrun by people hungry for a high-speed connection to information. At the Surrey Hills branch, you nearly always have to fight for somewhere to sit. We know people want access to information, and we know why. That access helps them to learn. It helps them to be productive. Actually, it's becoming difficult to be productive in the 21st century without immediate access to information. And so here's where I want to pose a question, something that I invite you to go away and ponder. How can institutions lean into this need? Now, for many years, libraries have offered Wi-Fi, uh, probably offered computers to the public so that people could go online. Now they offer Wi-Fi. What else should they offer? Should every library have a stack of cheap tablets that can be lent out to patrons? That would seem to be the logical extension of making the computers available, but it's, of course, updated to an era of cheap and powerful mobile devices. But devices and tables, while they are important, are table stakes. Once those goals have been satisfied, what comes next? How do we move from craptastic tablets and free Wi-Fi to the kinds of learning characterized by that 11-year-old winner of the young ICT explorers? Because they're not the same thing. One enables the other. Without connectivity, you can't get the kind of accelerated learning that we see. But connectivity itself is not enough. It needs to be backed up by the twin engines of constructivism and mimesis. And this is the core of the work that lies before us as educators. We have to transform the educational goals of the curriculum into something that can be learned by doing and learned by the doing of others. Now, last November, mathematician and entrepreneur Stephen Wolfram announced that Mathematica, which is his firm's fully visual learn by doing mathematics software, that that software was going to be released free 
on the Raspberry Pi. For anyone learning mathematics beyond the basics, Mathematica is an incredible tool. It brings numbers to life with fully interactive stuff and graphs and visualization aids. It's sort of a spreadsheet playpen for mathematics. And it takes the abstractions that students struggle with when they're learning maths and makes it all seem very concrete. And it's for that reason, used by professionals to help them with complex math projects. And if you are a professional, you'd be using Mathematica's standard version, which costs over $3,000. But Wolfram clearly sees the value of training a new generation of kids to use the tool, because some of those kids are going to grow up and become paying customers. But for us, it means that we now have the two elements in place to transform mathematics instruction. Mathematica provides the constructivist learning by doing platform, and the Raspberry Pi community, which is already very well connected, provides the chance that kids will be able to learn from another for that mimesis. Wolfram's revolution is going to take a few years to play out. It's big, it's complex, the program is very rich with features, and so it's going to take some time as the educators and students learn how to explore the world of maths. But the process has already begun. So can we take that methodology, which is the same methodology that brought us the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi and Scratch, can we take that methodology and apply it to other areas? Because we're doing it for maths. We know how this works now. We know what must be done, and we know how to do it. And this methodology, this methodology now defines the 21st century classroom, which is no longer a place with four walls and a whiteboard. In the age of craptastic devices and cheap broadband, the classroom isn't a place, it's an attitude. Almost anything we want to learn is now within our power to master, and that's as true for an 11-year-old as it is for a 51-year-old. Many of these learning-by-doing tools, such as Mathematica, already exist. They need to be brought to students. They need to be brought online. They need to be nurtured by communities of interest who will explore, who will answer questions, who will offer examples, and who will teach one another. And it's up to us to find those tools. It's up to us to share what we find. Because this process of transforming education is itself another process that we can bring into this methodology. We can learn by doing as we explore these tools. We can learn from others as we learn from the tools that others have found and how they've used them. And this talk itself is an example of that methodology put into practice, featuring both what I've learned myself from my own experience and what I've learned from others. There's nothing unusual about that. That's the way we learn. But now, 20 years into the web era, we know enough of how to lean into this process to start to get the best results from it. And finally, we have to remember that passion provides the spark that ignites the fires of learning. Whether we're 9 or we're 90 years old, we already orient ourselves toward our passions. And that might be sport or history or tech or pop stars. And then we bury ourselves in websites and communities and social media sharing and learning everything we can about the things we love. That content, it might be trivial, but the way we're learning now is completely revolutionary. That's the world we already live in. And so it's time now to bring our formal processes into harmony with how we live our daily lives. Marry learning by doing with learning from others and transform education. Thank you. And you can see the URL there on the screen. If you go to that URL, that will give you the PDF text 